parking charges. It's an absolute disgrace. What you're going to do is absolutely ruin Easton for a place to go for families, for dog walkers, walkers, for lots of people. The revenue you're going to raise, it's, it's minimal to the hassle you're going to cause. Can I just raise a point? Uh, you don't seem to be listening to me. You don't, that's sad. You do not seem to be listening to well, me. Sir. I think Richard, 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 just I'm not like no, no, Richard, no, no. Can you switch your microphone on, please? Ah, yes, please. There's only one microphone on at the time you see otherwise. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I can assure you the members are listening. Now, if you'd like to, can you, you've got five minutes now. You, you're wasting quite a bit of it here. Um, but please, just. The witnesses are asked to come today, and I try as chair to give as much leeway as I possibly can. But I'm a calling, and the lead signature, Tom, Tom Anderson, should have told you. The witnesses come in and read out a prepared statement. Now, you obviously haven't got a prepared statement. But let me finish. But I'm allowing you the leeway of saying what you've come here to say. But please don't make any accusations against any members of the committee. I can assure you that all of them are listening. So I don't need a response to what I've just said. If you just carry on and say what you've come here to, to say today, please. And you've got two and a half minutes left. I think what the councillors need to uh, look at is the 20 pledges. People, businesses and environments and you're harming all those by implementing these charges. Particularly in Eastern where I walk the dog. That's all I've got to say. I think you need to reconsider. There was a Green Key scheme in Snowdonia. They spent lots of money trying to implicate, impl implicate, uh, impl implement it. It was a parking scheme. In the end, it got thrown out because it wasn't, it wasn't feasible. And this is going down the same route. You're going to spend a lot of money for a catastrophe. And that's what it's going to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just just, just any of the committee would like to ask you any questions. Anyone got any questions for Richard? Steve? Thanks, Richard. The, the Snowdonian um, scheme, could you elaborate on that at all, what it was and how, how why did it fail? It was a car parking scheme. The um, Snowdonian park would go to implement. They got consultants in, they paid them lots and lots of money. But then they had a consultation program with the people who actually used the park. The businesses, the actual people, Walkers, climbers, they all threw it out because it was not feasible. Uh, I'd just like to, to come back on Stephen and I'll bring you to Christina. Um, Mobama's in, in the Snowdonia range, and Mobama, which we, we go quite often and I go with my grandchildren, has quite recently doubled its car parking charges at Mobama. And, um, Round, round Snowden, to go up Snowden, there's quite a few car parks. Again, we do Snowden, and I'm, I'm hoping to take my grandchildren this summer. And Snowden in particular is quite expensive to park around there. Um, and in May, May, May Bank Holiday, I did the Three Peaks. So I did Snowden in Wales, Scarfell in England, and we finished off in um, Fort William. In, in the bend, we finished off on the bend. And the car parking charges in all three, we did Snowden at night, so there was no, the car parking charges weren't applying because we started at nine o'clock at night. Scarfell, which is in the middle of nowhere, and going back to Eastham, it's a very, very narrow, unadopted road to get to Scarfell. It's beautiful. And it cost us nine pounds. And it's National Trust as well, by the way 
who are raising these charges to maintain the beauty of these places. And again, on the, on the Ben up in Fort William, there's, there's places where you can park for free, there's on road parking, and there's a car park there by the Ben which is charged. And it manages very, very well. So the thing about, and I'm not really sure about the, the Snowdonia one that, that Richard mentioned there, which was thrown out, but I do know, being a regular climber up there, is it's very expensive when you, when you drive. And there's about four or five car parks, or if you're going up snow in itself, and there's four or five different paths you can go up. But I do know um, that the car parking around all these beauty spots, and they are beautiful, and as I said with Scarfell, it's National Trust land and they're implementing these charges. And what I would say is, on, on Scarfell, because we were there very early in the morning and we still had to pay five o'clock in the morning we got there. And we had to pay, the car park was full and there were people coming to and from when we were leaving. And we were in a rush because we were rushing up to Fort William. Um, so, I, I, we've got to come back to the reality of why we're here today. Thank you. Yeah, I do believe that Lowell Van Lake is in the Covidian range. It's not in Snowdonia. Well, I stand corrected. Stand corrected, yeah. I also believe Eastern Country Park should be free for everybody to use. Yes, yes you, you've made that. And we've taken on board, and all the members have taken on board. But mountains are a different thing. What are you going to about yeah. mountains for? Are you going to go to park? Steve, did you have to It's a well-known landmark, it's known. Please, please. Oh, yeah, new chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Richard, the three of you have made the difference between the snow building and the Caribbean. And um, the Pennine chains are slightly different than Eastern Ferry in relation to what visitor attraction would be. So I, I take the points that you, I understand. When you said one of the car parkings didn't actually work, is that because people decided to move to a different area to park? They wanted, sorry, they wanted to implement a green key scheme where they wanted the traffic out of the park, so they wanted to have major car parks installed, so that people driving through the car park go up the mountains. That what they wanted to do was have a minibus run through the park but also charging lots and lots of money to do so. Which I've kind of failed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now call Pat Gibson Saxty, please, from Eastern Country Park. Thank you, Pat. Again, can I remind you of the five minutes, please, if you can. Thank you. Press the screen, please. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I woke up this morning and I looked out of my bathroom window at the car park, which is about 10 metres away from my home. And I looked at the giant oak trees which grow in the middle what is actually quite a small car park really and I thought what will they do with these if they decide to put meters in? Will they leave them alone or will they bulldoze them to squeeze in a few more cars? And the thought of that was unbearable. I've lived in that home for 60 years before it was a country park and you know what the woods took pretty good care of themselves they didn't need such manicuring they were always beautiful and the word rangers are. So to say <coughs> that the woods are going to fall into such disrepair that people will be put off visiting them is a nonsense. Nature looks after itself. I know the rhythm of Eastern Country Park. I know the rhythm of East Ferry because it's my home, it's where I am. Uh, I know the heart of the place uh, and I know that the soul will be ripped out of it if ugly meters appear. I'm concerned about the aesthetics of it as much as anything else because parking meters are ugly, 
ugly metal structures. And this is a very graceful area. And it certainly doesn't need that ugliness and it certainly doesn't need yellow lines. It will urbanise it. It will take away its very nature. And it would be a criminal, criminal act to do it in my view. It would be official vandalism. Nothing less. But I've deviated from what I'm saying. I feel passionately about this. And I will never let this go. I feel so passionately. And everybody I speak to feels passionately as well. 20,000 signatures. Um, oh, it's just a name and an address, a name, a name, a postcard, a name, a name, a name. You don't know these people, but I don't know a lot of them, some of them at least. And I know the passion that they feel. They're not just signing another petition. They are up in arms about it and they're despairing of it. And some of them can't even bear to think about it. They say, we've been coming here for years. It, it, the damage will be irreparable. There's no going back from this, it will be a major cultural shift. What, for a few more bob in the kitty? Because that's all it amounts to. Anyway, Eastern Country Park holds immense value, as we all know. It's as a long-standing major leisure and nature conservation area. I believe it's about 100 acres. And it's the last remaining substantial area of undeveloped land with public access on the Wirral. I didn't know that till today. We all know we've got a real treasure here. It's entirely ancient and unique. It's been swarmed by people visiting since the 1100s and it remains so today. The council are guardians of the land, but really it belongs to all the people down the ages who have ever visited for relaxation, stress reduction, and simply to be in nature. Eastern Country Park provides a very necessary safety valve of rest and calm in these hectic times and it will lose that function if people are having to keep an eye on the time, hurry back in order to feed the meter and there are some who won't be able to afford to come at all and this is the reality and I know this because I was once one of them. I spent a time on the dole some years ago and I remember looking for loose change down the back of the settee to catch the bus. And I remember selling my jewellery to pay an electricity bill. I wouldn't have sold it to pay for a year's parking in advance, however. And the people who are the poorest amongst us do not have 50 quid up front to pay for parking in advance. It's a nonsense. It's easy when you get a bit well healed, like we all are, let's be honest, it's easy to forget where we come from if we have, or what it's like if we haven't. It's easy to forget the poorest amongst us, and maybe the people that need it most. But the joys of those children when they're running through the woods, I wouldn't miss that for anything. And I know that some of those people would struggle if they had to pay, and I know that the answer would be no when the kids said, can we go to the woods, Mum, can we go to the woods, Dad? I know that. I talk to people. And I know that my garden is a very special place of tranquility and peace and sanity for people. And only last week, a person, a customer, um, phoned me up out of blue, and she said, would you do us the honour of allowing us to put a bench in your tea garden in memory of my granddaughter? And I said, oh, of course. And I was like, like she was doing us a favour. It was the other way around. And she came and we talked. And it turned out that her granddaughter, Jade, had, I'm okay, had committed suicide a month before when she was 27 because of her mental health issues. And the family said that it was coming to Eastern Country Park and sitting in my garden that kept them sane during this tragedy in their lives. And that's just one story. And you could say, well, one, to one, but just one person. But we're talking about thousands of people here. Thousands of people who really, really care. And you need to have people who care in the world. Because we look after the place, you see. You need to listen to us and please, Please, I beg of you, do not do this foolish thing, which will spoil it forever.
just a quick comment really, you're obviously very passionate and very eloquent and very convincing about all you said. What would you think the impact of charges would be on your actual business? We've covered the, about the yeah. emotional side of things, but I'm also concerned about the impact on your business and the, the activities that you undertake. Well, uh, it, would, it would impact it. I mean, interestingly, that has been my primary... I, I care about the area. Um, I care about the business too. Um, and uh, I, I, it's difficult to know, but I, I've, had, I've heard people say, God, we're going to really miss this because we won't be able to afford to come so often. See, some people come every day. Every day, some people come. And, uh, you know, they, they have a habit, they walk their dogs and they, they come and they have a chat and they know the staff, and there's a lot that goes on. It's not just a business, it's like home from home to some people. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I wouldn't expect anything else, but very eloquent. Two, two things. One is that uh, David's already touched on. Um, is there any car parking attached to your business is the first question. And the second one is, it was mentioned by uh, fellow Councillor Gilchrist that it's in the 1960s that Bevington Council, in its wisdom, decided to, to turn it into one of the first country parks in the country. <coughs> What effect did that have on your family? Would you like to explain to the committee? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, the first question. Um, there is no... I mean, I would have to pay the car parking charges. The car park is as far away as the chair is from me. Uh, I don't have any parking in my, on my property. All my night staff would have to pay charges. Um, and no one's going to double yellow line outside my house because I will lie there <laughs> till I'm physically removed, I can assure you of that. Um, regarding the, um, uh, the business, um, the impact, I mean that was just my house that I grew up in um, and there was no country park and it was isolated and my mum and dad were approached by the council in, uh, I think it was around 1970, to say they wanted to make it into a country park, would they consider serving the odds a cup of tea and coffee so that people could, they could say they had refreshments? So they were a bit reluctant, but they said, oh, well, okay then. So my dad plugged an extension in from the house into his potting shed and put a kettle in. And about three people a week came. It was really, really small. And the council laid a path up to the they had a little kiosk, it was his potting shed. Um, and then gradually, of course, more and more people got to hear about how lovely it was and they glad they could get a cup of tea so more and more people came. And my parents and me me together have worked that for 46 years. We've worked that for 46 years welcoming people, bandaging knees, giving them vinegar for wasp stings, all that. Yeah, all that, listening to the kids. They know us, they remember coming when they were children. They know us and they can't believe what's happening. They say, how can they possibly do that? How can they even consider it? And some are very despairing and they are very cynical. And they say things like, well, what's the point? What's the point? They're going to do it anyway. Well, I don't believe that, you see. I believe in people. And I, we're all just people, aren't we? You've got kids, a lot of you. You've got grandkids. And you want the best for them and you love them. Yeah. You know, some of your grandkids might be on the dole one day, hopefully not. But they might not be able to afford it. And it really, really, really matters because we have to look after the sanity of our community. There's so much ill health. I have a mentally ill daughter myself, and I know the strain of that. I look after her three children a lot. So we have to. We have to be conscious. It's so easy in a moment to toe the party line, to put your hand up and say, well, it's a tough decision, but tough decisions have to be made. We don't mind doing this, but oh, I'll go home soon and I'll have something nice for me to take. It's so easy to do that, isn't it? But the repercussions of this will be long lasting down the generations. Long after you are here, long after I'm here, the repercussions will be there and it will make the place ugly and it's That's precious. I've got it. A member here sorry. would like to ask you a question. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Karen. Just one small thought that you have a business within the um, area. If you wish to put a, say, a metre square board to advertise your product or whatever it is, 
you would have to apply to planning, I understand. This would normally go through planning. If you go into the country park, you'll have five or six metre boards, big square ones, who are telling you when, how, what, how much. I'm led to believe council don't have to worry about that. They don't even have to apply to planning for this. And to me, it will be an, an absolute I justice. Now, can you quote whether, if you are going to put an advert on the building or whatever, do you apply to planning for it? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't read well, that. Sorry, I, don't you know, no, I, I imagine so. I imagine I would. You see, anything that changes the physical nature of the place, of course, has to be approved by someone because otherwise there could be, it'd be like graffiti everywhere, wouldn't it? I'm concerned, I'm a, I, my first thing is I'm an artist, right? I did six years art training, so I'm very concerned about the visual impact of these proposals. And anything that looks ugly, I'm right there, I tell you. I'll fight if anything is ugly, because we need beauty in our lives, we need soothing, we need peace. We all know that, come on, we're all people. It's, I'm fed up the, of the source of new and them and them and all that wretched stuff. We are people and we care and together we can do something better than this. Are there any further questions? I've been told that they could not, uh, she would not know the answer. Possibly more than the answer. Can I just clarify, so to put a sign up, which we don't know the size of the sign, we don't know the oh, dimensions. Yeah. I'm giving you a metre square sign. Right. Would you need planning permission for a metre square sign, Mark? Through you, Chair, to, to place signs on the highway that uh, advertise a business, uh, you would need to go through a planning related process to that for that. Um, having said that, obviously uh, Ms. Gibson Saxony has a, a business with, I'm familiar with the location, with just appropriate signage, to nice signage which actually highlights people where the tea garden is, which is, which is a very, very attractive sign. Which, 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 I wouldn't have these big ballooning things that some of the businesses go for because they make the place ugly. It's not worth it to get a few more customers in. I'm not interested in bums on seats, I'm interested in people and the quality of our lives. Are there any further questions? Uh, I'm sorry, Chair. You still didn't answer the final question. Was, did the council have to go and ask for a plan? Mark did answer that. He didn't answer the question about, did the council have to approach it? Did the council, do the council have to apply for planning to put these signs up within the country park? Well, the car. Private members out with the public element. So just to ascertain, so if we introduce car parking charges, do we have to apply for planning permission to put the sign up telling people in how the, much in the well, yes. well country yes. park? Yes. Do we want? Yes. yes. The, 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 pro, the process that we go, apologies, I, I, I assume the question was relating to external parties wanting to put signs on. Yeah, so, so I, I apologize, I misunderstood that. So, um, the, uh, the, there's a process for applying car parking charges and the associated signage that goes with it. My understanding is that that is all covered, so we're doing that as the you know, as the highway traffic, as the traffic authority in a particular area, and it's all covered by the process that we've just been through as a council, of which this is the final step that we're, we're talking about the decision today. Thank you, Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go on, Christine. Pat, I'm, I'm going to turn the question back on you because I agree with you a lot of what you said. But in fact, the last day my father was alive, we drove him down so that he could look over the river before the trees grew over because he loved it so much. So I like to be very passionate. So I'm going to ask you the question. 
and I'd been in your cafe when it was little and all the rest I've seen it grow. I've seen your lovely pictures and all the lovely things in the garden. I've always loved it. But what do we do have? Because we have no money. This government has starved of us money. We have to do something. We get our heads together and we pool ideas and we come up, we, just, we amaze ourselves with our own creativity. Yeah. There's a big field outside my my little tea garden, which the council own. I don't see why that can't be used for activities, for um, even car boot sales or something of that nature. That there's lots of ways of getting a bit of revenue, which are creative rather than destructive. And the, the amount of revenue which is going to come from this is not, we're not going to notice that it's minimal. Can, can I just go back to you though, you talk about car boot sales where we, people have thought about all these things because this is, we've been seven years on this. Every single year, cutting, cutting, cutting to the bone. This is something that we have, I know certain, all my colleagues, have fought against having to do this. All the time that these cuts have been, and I will call them cuts, have been imposed on us. But our problem is, it's not one-offs. It has to be ongoing. I understand that the car boot sale was a great idea. It's just off the top of my head. But there are, um, there will be other ways of raising money. But if you make a fear-based decision because of, of, you know, the austerity, and that's like fearful, isn't it? Oh, you know, and all this. That's that's when we go down the wrong road. We have to actually believe in something better and keep the good that we've got. It's like throwing a baby out of the bathwater. We don't want to do that. We keep the good and we enhance it and we make it better. Yeah. You have to turn your mic on. Oh. Can I just say though that we, we're not working in fear. We're working in the most logical way every year, all through the year, to make sure our books balance. Knowing that in 2020 we have so little money coming in, we have to generate it all ourselves. And this is what we have to do. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, thanks, Pat. Thank you very much for being so eloquent and passionate. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We've got our, our last witness now, last but not least, I might add, Karen James Hunt, please, from Eastern Country Park. Thanks, Karen. Can I remind you of the five minutes, if you can? Thank you. Uh, Chair, councillors, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to, to speak to you about this. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Eastern Country Park, uh, well actually Eastern Ferry, which is where Eastern Country Park is located. We've already heard about Eastern Ferry being a very unique place in Wirral. Um, and the introduction of car parking charges at, this, at the country park will impact in ways that will not impact on the other country parks in Wirral or indeed in the other country parks and areas that have been mentioned, Snowdonia, Novamba, Scarfell. Eastern Ferry is very, very unique. As well as there also being uh, some large housing estates adjacent to the country park, which the others don't, there are five businesses, including Pat's, which we've just heard about. Five businesses at Eastern Ferry that exist in their own right. There are five businesses that draw customers from far and wide outside of Will that do so despite the country park. If the country park wasn't there, these businesses would still be there, they'd still thrive. Because the majority of people who come to visit them are not there to visit the country park, they're there to visit and enjoy the facilities offered by these businesses. There's the most tea gardens we've just heard about. It's a family-run business that's been there for nearly 50 years. It's a haven in a busy world and draws customers who come to experience the tranquility of the gardens. There's the Tap Pub. It's been operating since the, in, the, in the 1800s, drawing a very mixed clientele who come to sit on the patio outside and enjoy the magnificent views across the Mersey. And of course, it's the, one of the most popular bikers clubs in the northwest of England, drawing bikers every weekend from all over North England, indeed North Wales, probably further afield than that. There is the Eastern Ferry Pub, which has been there since 1846. It draws a family crowd with gardens providing fantastic views over the Mersey and large play areas for children. There's the historical ticket office, 
that draws families and people who, who just want to sit on the grass or in their cars parked along the road so they can look over the, the, over the mirrors and see the views. And then there's my business, uh, Eastern Cattery, and I, I get customers from all over North Wales, Cheshire, Merseyside, to come and board their cats. So if all these businesses draw people down to Eastern Ferry in their own right, why will the introduction of car parking charges be so devastating? Well, people visiting the businesses want to park outside those businesses. They don't want to or need to park in the country park. I live right next door to the country park. Actually, it was once part of my property. I take my dog out two or three times a day. I know how busy that car park gets. In the summer, of course, it is very, very busy. But in the winter, quieter months, you'd be lucky to see four or five cars in that car park. There are more cars parked on the roads leading up to the car park. So once car parking charges are introduced, there will be an issue of displacement. The cars that would normally park in the car park will end up parking on the road with the rest of the vehicles. So what will this council do to address the, 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 the minimal loss of income in the quieter months? Spend more money on meter, introducing meters, doubling and aligning the roads. And this will force people to use the car park. In the summer months, at weekends, it's a whole different story, of course. You'll have all seen the photographs that Councillor Gilchrist um, circulated. In the summer months, the car park is full, but so are the roads around. Dozens and dozens of bikes line Ferry Road, past Eastern Ferry Hotel, intermixed with cars and people who are just parked up to enjoy the view and, and enjoy a drink. Many of those uh, have physical disabilities or limited uh, mobility. They can't walk from the car park to the road to enjoy the view. I love it there. There's nothing like the buzz of stepping out the door, seeing the place packed full of cars and bikes and people and children laughing and enjoying themselves. And, and that's not to mention the charity days that take place down there, which are put on by those businesses. And, and they, it's, there's hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of people who come down. What will happen when the council puts in meters or doubly aligns those roads? When the car park is full, where will all those people who normally park on the road who can't get in the car park? Where will they park to visit those businesses who are drawing people in their own right? Okay, so all those businesses draw people in their own right. People who don't go to the country park, they just come for the businesses and for the view across the Mersey. What will happen? Why should my customers who take 10, 15 minutes to drop off or collect a cat spend money to, to, to park up to do that? Most of the people visiting these businesses park on the roads and they're there to visit the businesses. So still no consultation has taken place. Still the council doesn't understand or care to understand the consequences of introducing car parking charges at Eastern Country Park and the subsequent inevitable meters and double yellow lining. Still there appears to be no interest in the impact all this will have on our businesses. It will be catastrophic. People will not come. And I completely challenge Stuart Whittingham to believe that it isn't appropriate to consult specific parties involved. It is. We are businesses and we bring people down in our own right to, country, to Eastern Country Park. This is about the viability of five businesses and the vitality of a community that is built up around them. I implore you, please do not vote down party lines. Vote with common sense and vote with your conscience. Please, thank you. Have any members got any questions? Dave, I've just got one very quick one. Helen, um, your business is so well known. It's what well, it's highlighted as one of the places of excellence for the categories to to come. So you do, I do know for a fact that people come from far and wide to uh, to <coughs> access your business. And literally, you are surrounded by the car park. Aren't you? Yeah. People, I don't think people realise the car park. Christine will know, of course. You've got the main car park. If you're looking out of your front door, to your right, and then you've got your ripple icon, you don't know who you want, and you're left. So you're actually surrounded by the car park. Do you agree with me that if these implementations are put in place, it will have a detrimental effect on your business? Absolutely. I think my business is the least affected. I do have very limited off street parking. But because I'm a successful business and um, I have a lot of customers coming, people have to park on the road or in the car park if there's already cars parked on my property. So why should a customer who's coming to put their cat in the country, which has absolutely nothing to do with the country park, why should they have to pay for the privilege of coming to my business? And I've got a very loyal customer base, as have 
all the other businesses down at Middle East and Ferry. But there is a risk of people saying, do you know what, I just can never park when I get down there. I'm going to put my cat somewhere else. And that's a very real risk. It's my home as well as business. Like Pat, I live and breathe Eastern Ferry. I know it like the back of my hand. I've lived there over 10 years now, not as long as Pat, but still 10 years is a long time. <laughs> and uh, it's, it will be devastating. It will, it will take the soul out of this area, uh, out of the community.